some of the issues around how to get the access to the right expertise when you're using cohort data. So we've assembled quite a, a diverse panel um, and you'll get a chance to meet them all in a moment when they introduce themselves. I won't go through them all in detail now, but all bringing lots of um, experience and different aspects of using cohort data and different aspects of tackling mental health issues. So looking forward to hearing from them all. Uh, just in terms of housekeeping, you'll, you'll probably realise this, but all your videos are off and all your microphones are muted except for the panellists. You can introduce yourself on the chat function in um, in Teams if, if, you, if you'd like to do that. As I've said now, the way to ask some questions is, is through Slido. So, so we're hoping that people um, will put forward some questions through Slido. You enter that link and you um, enter the code cohort. We will be recording this session. Uh, and it will be uh, subsequently available on the Sachs Institute website. Uh, so I might stop there in terms of what I wanted to share with you all. Um, and we might, I might stop sharing my screen and I'm, we might go to the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, so in no particular order, why don't you kick us off, Julie? You're on, you're on mute at the moment, Julie, yeah. Yep, nothing like a bright start and be on mute. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Biles. I'm from the University of Newcastle and I'm one of the directors of the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health, which means I've been um, working with that longitudinal study since 1996 when we first recruited the women and we've been following those women through um, from their early 20s uh, through to their 40s in some cases and from their early 70s through to their um, late 90s um, in the oldest case. So. We've been uh, following their lives and learning heaps about them. So that's me and why I'm here today. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Karen, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Atsteer from the University of New South Wales. Um, I've worked on cohort studies for over 20 years. I actually started with the Australian Longitudinal Study of Ageing, which was my postdoc. And we looked at mental health as a predictor of longevity and falls. Um, but in 2001, I became a chief investigator on the Path Through Life project, and then I became lead investigator in 2006. And that study really focuses on mental health, um, both as a predictor and an outcome. And um, I do a lot of work on cognitive decline and dementia. So I've also worked on a lot of other cohort studies and projects that synthesise um, cohort studies as well. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Andrew, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Page. I'm an epidemiologist at the Translational Health Research Institute at Western Sydney University. Um, uh, I'm kind of uh, uh, more a user of, of cohort studies that have already been uh, collected. So I've worked on, for example, on 45 and up study in Australia, but also um, uh, overseas cohort studies. So the, you know, the Avon longitudinal study of Parents and Children in the UK, the OLSPAC study, um, and also more recently and in, in sort of predominantly using linked administrative data sets, so hospital data um, uh, and, and, and PHN, uh, primary, he primary health network data, um, and also a little bit of primary data collection as well. So we've um, been sort of experimenting with some more perhaps innovative ways of collecting exposure information using smartphones um, which we did in, a, in an adolescent health and wellbeing study uh, last year as well. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I might go next to Annette. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Annette Erlingsen. Uh, I am from the Danish uh, Research Institute for Suicide Prevention, but I'm also an honorary associate professor at the uh, Center for Mental Health Research at the AMU in Canberra. So that's why I'm here. I'm living in Canberra, so I don't need to get up that early to participate here. Uh, I have uh, worked on uh, studies of uh, with cohort uh, studies and longitudinal data for about 20 years, uh, predominantly using uh, Danish uh, linkage data. So uh, as some of you might know, in, in some countries, there's administrative data on the, on the whole population. We know where everyone is living and uh, we have these civil data that we can link to hospital data and uh, course of death data. So we can follow the entire population over time. And that's a, a very valuable resource for, for research. And uh, I'm very thrilled to see that that has become 
increasingly possible in Australia. I think it's still some years before it will be really blossoming, but it's really a, a very valuable resource for research. Uh, I also had the pleasure of uh, working a little bit with the 40, uh, 45 and up study. So yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, thanks, Annette. Uh, Kate, Kate Des, do you want to go next? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Diest and I'm a part-time advisor to the SACS. My previous role was Chair of Biostatistics at the Australian National University and before that at the University of Newcastle. And I have been involved in various cohort studies over many years, including 45 and up, the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health, PATH at some stage with Karen and um, WHO Global Study of um, Ageing and Adult Health and probably some others that I've forgotten about as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. And Pumi, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a Research and Evaluation Officer at the Sachs Institute and PhD candidate at the Translational Health Research Institute at Western Sydney University. Admittedly, I don't have a lot of experience using cohort data, but over the past couple of years, I've examined a range of mental health data measurements. So in Sri Lanka, as part of my PhD, I was involved in the primary data collection um, of a range of mental health uh, related measures, including validated scales for depression, suicidal ideation and adverse childhood experiences. Um, as an EMCR, I've also undertaken suicide prevention research very closely with Andrew Page. <clears throat> Okay, I think I've gone through everyone in terms of an introduction of the panelists. So thanks very much everyone for joining us and really great uh, panel, I think, as you can all see. So we're not um, being flooded with questions at the moment on Slido. So we will kick off with some questions that we've thought of already, but uh, I do encourage people to get onto Slido and, and put forward their questions so that we can make sure we can cover off on things that people are interested in, in asking the panel. I mean, one of the ones that um, we've been thinking about a bit at the Institute recently that I'm, I'm curious about the panelists views on is the issue of privacy around mental health and how that's handled in cohort studies. So, so clearly um, mental health is a sensitive issue and there's lots of um, potential uh, challenges in dealing with uh, mental health research. So I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has some advice or some experience they can tell us about around handling privacy concerns when using mental health related data in, um, in cohort studies. Uh, Julie, do you want to go first? Yeah. I'm happy to say something. And I think privacy is obviously a big issue and we we do assure people that their data will be kept confidential. But um, as pe if people have been through the ethics processes, there is a there's caveat to that, that if people reveal um, a crime, for instance, um, that's something that's reportable. There's another thing which is about duty of care. And I think that's probably... I think as researchers, we're all very good at privacy, I hope. Um, but I think the the bigger duty, we, well, the bigger responsibility we take on is about duty of care when we're dealing with mental health issues. Now, it's there's one thing about putting out the CESD or something like that and getting people to do the numbers, but there's, there's something more about what you do in response to that and what your responsibility is. And in the longitudinal study on women's health, we invited people to make comments. And so now we have a duty of care to read those comments. They're brilliant resource for research, but they also do sometimes reveal people who are in distress or danger. Um, so then it becomes a very difficult job as a researcher to know what to do with that. And um, you go straight to your... Um, to get advice, do you, you get um, you know when once it once it's breached a certain level, you need to get the um, input from your institution because it actually could escalate to something that requires police intervention or something. Mm -hmm. like. mm. Anyone else got any comments on this question? Karen, do you have any views? Yeah, I mean, there's different angles to this issue. Um, the first is the consent process and ethical approval of the study. So that in the data collection, we as researchers um, need to get our protocols approved by the Institutional Ethics Committee, which involves compliance with the, the privacy laws in your jurisdiction, your state or territory. Um, so we all end up covering off 
and, and in terms of our data storage, we have to store our data according to both institutional and state and federal laws for privacy. Um, there are issues using international data sets in that you also have to be mindful of the international privacy laws. And so we've found we haven't been able to share data internationally because of that. Um, so I guess that there was, from the researcher side, we follow very strict protocols. From the participant side, um, when the participant gives consent, they're giving informed consent to know what happens with their data. And so there's just multiple angles you need to consider. Um, the issue that Julie raised is if we, as a researcher, discover a clinical situation, and we usually have protocols for those as well, which our interviewers are trained to administer. So at threshold, they'll get trigger a referral or we, so with our study, we have a clinical psychologist on the team who is, who's on our ethics approval, who's nominated to deal with any mental health issue that comes up in the field. But that's slightly different to the privacy. Mm. And then with the linked data, that's done all at arm's length. So it's mm. almost impossible to have a privacy breach because the people linking the data don't actually ever see the research data. They're just linking the codes. So mm. there are incredible um, uh, processes built into the way that we conduct research now that prevent a privacy breach. Um, so I think I'm hoping, I'm not sure. Oh, actually, this is a question that the panel came up with, but I'm just saying if, if there was a specific question that someone has about that, if they could put it into the Slido and we could try yeah. to address it because we think a lot about this and we train our staff. They're all doing privacy workshops and um, so it is very well managed. Thanks, Karen. So just before we throw to Annette, who's got a hand up, um, can I just check that if people aren't quite getting into Slido or having problems with it, you can, of course, use the comment function in Teams if you've got a question and we can try and keep track of what people are asking about through that um, method as well. So Annette, do you want to go next? Yeah, so uh, as the other panelists were mentioning, of course, there is the protocols that one has to adhere to and there is the permissions you need to get ahead of it. But on the other end, also, when you report your findings, you have to respect the privacy. And usually there are some set rules about that you're not allowed to report things that are identifiable and uh, in, in, in some countries they have, you cannot have any cell that has less than three as a value mm. to protect the, the individuals in the end of the dissemination also, of course. Yeah, thanks Annette. Uh, so we might move on to the next question list, Andrew or Pumi wanted to add to any of that? I was, I was just going to maybe follow yep. on from Annette's comment there and, and ask her about the, the Danish experience. I mean, are there you know, given the, the you know the very detailed linkage that's possible, you know, on the sort of implicit privacy issues around that. I mean, what what's the sort of um, population's response to to this? Are they is there a sense that that the, the you know the Danish population are very happy for all of these data sets to be available to researchers um, and linked together? Yeah, so it is actually a very uh, sensitive topic, of course, because uh, as a researcher. I have access to very detailed information about every single individual in the country, but uh, we also sign uh, agreements that we know we will be prosecuted uh, legally if we uh, use this information and uh, we're not allowed to identify individuals. Um, the system uh, of, um, of having a personal ID number was introduced in 1968, and first it was introduced to uh, lessen the administrative burden and the transition for starting to use it for research purposes came rather early and it was a slow rollout in the sense of uh, First, you had to be in a specific building, a geographic building. You had to be in the building of Statistics Denmark in Copenhagen. And now slowly it got more and more accessible. Now I can access data from Denmark. But um, luckily there has not been any cases of abuse of it uh, from a research perspective. And we just try to disseminate out whenever we can that it's really a very valuable resource. So that I think that's, I haven't heard any people uh, objecting to it. Most people, they don't know that it exists. Uh, so if you tell the ordinary citizen about it, they're like, oh, I didn't know. But uh, when you explain the use of it, they're like, oh, well, 
it's not like a, they don't consider it as a problematic issue, but I, I realize there are some cultural barriers for this because in, in some other countries, this would not be possible. Hmm. So thank, thanks, Annette. We might move on to another sort of subject then. So um, really about what's in the surveys themselves. So I think most of the people on the call would be aware there's various survey instruments looking at um, mental health status and, and clinical mental health disorders. Um, so I, I guess there's a cluster of questions around that that we could explore here. One is how well do those instruments really measure, uh, you know, clinical mental health disorder? And then how there might be some variation in different age or cultural groups as to the the effect or the, the sort of accuracy of that measurement. So I'm wondering, uh, perhaps Karen, could you kick us off on this one, Karen? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, so uh, as many of the audience know or, or have seen, the big surveys usually use symptom scales. Um, the most common ones are usually measuring mood or psychological distress. Um, so the PHQ or um, the SESD is a measure of depression. Um, there's some more general ones like the SF mental health scale. And I think um, it's really important to recognise the difference between a symptom scale and a clinical diagnosis of a mental a disorder. Um, so, uh, you know, people who work as clinicians use the DSM or the ICD coding to diagnose and classify um, mental health disorders. And they're quite detailed classifications of different subtypes of anxiety or mood disorders. And in one of those symptom scales, you're not ever going to get to that level of classification or diagnosis. So we're talking about two quite different things. And I think it's important that we understand the strengths, but also the limitations of our research. So whilst it's wonderful that we may have this huge data set, the, the, the depth of information on mental health may be somewhat limited unless it's a specific mental health survey that's spending one or two hours doing a proper structured interview to get those proper diagnostic um, categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do any other panelists want to comment on this question about the, the sort of assessment of mental health through these instruments? Andrew? I mean, I, I you know, I, I agree with uh, Karen on that. And I guess it also depends on what you're interested in, in measuring as well. And the, the key um, you know, strength of longitudinal designs, of course, is, is is time, you know, and trajectories over time. So if you are measuring something that may not be, you know, uh, you know, a clinical diagnosis, but is a symptom, but you, you're, you're tracking the same thing over time, that, that gives you information, useful information around change and determinants of those change, changes as well. So I guess it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a, a problem if you haven't got a clinical diagnosis, if that's not sort of the main thing that you're interested in, mm -hmm. and I guess the other the other feature of um, of um, you know some of the cohort studies here in Australia is you can link them to administrative databases where there is a kind of you know a clinical diagnosis, if you like, of a, where at least relating to a presentation for an acute mental health condition, which can sometimes be categorised in terms of specific mental disorder and you know or drug and alcohol or whatever it might be mm -hmm. so there are other ways that you can kind of you know um, uh, obtain objective measures if that's something that is of, of interest but some but some, sometimes it's more about you know being interested in that trajectory of change yeah absolutely yeah any other thoughts so um, going on yeah. yeah could i have said something to that so yes absolutely yeah. it's the longitudinal data is just the incredible strength of cohort studies and and that's that's you know their number one value um just in terms of the other part of that question which was about the age groups i just noticed in aging some of the symptoms of the mental health scales are also symptoms that are common in aging generally in the population so for example fatigue or um, trouble sleeping um, are actually quite common um, as people get older. And so we tend to use specific measures of anxiety and depression for, for older populations that exclude those items or else we analyse and take that into account. So, and I'm sure that there's similar parallels in other populations, whether to do with gender, ethnic diversity, cult um, cultural diversity, there may be symptoms that um, mean something different in, in some particular population. So, mm. so I'd mention that. 
Thanks, uh, Karen. So, Julia or Annette, do you have any comments you want to make on this question? Annette, yeah. Oh, sorry, Julia, you're on mute. I just want to allude to this thing of that that measures might change over time. So, depending on how often you collect data, you might miss things in and and in, in terms of symptoms there's also the the, the challenge of course between having uh, information that is based on uh, clinical diagnosis from hospitals or if you have uh, self reported data and there there's usually not a complete uh, fit between these two which is another challenge you have to deal with in some cases you can uh, also use uh, other data sources to uh, to uh, supplement findings. For instance, if you have data on prescriptions, you might be able to uh, identify periods of, of more crisis through through looking at, at prescription data. But it's, it's a balancing thing, of course. Thanks, Annette. Did Julie, were you going to add something there? I, I think probably the only thing I want to add is about the um, the sort of co-relationship between mental health and physical health that can occur, it, there's not a, a clear distinction. And so we certainly, um, as Karen has said, that there, if you take the K10, which is in the 45 and up study, there are some components with of that, which are, when you analyse it in older cohorts, they come out as a distinct, it's normally you analyse it and you've got a bit like an anxiety component, a depression component, but you do get a fatigue component in older people. But I think also to assume that all of it is due to ageing um, or due to physical problems, I think these things go hand in hand and there can be a, and a current's not disagreeing with me, there can definitely be an effective component to that and depression can make the problems of ageing worse. They can make the problems of dementia worse. Mm -hmm. And so disentangling these things can be very difficult in older age and probably in younger age too. I think we underestimate um, the impact of multimorbidity in younger age. So if you think of acne or something, acne, endometriosis, and then um, depression, put all those things together, they're not helping each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's sort of, to me, there's a follow-on question here about what you can do across cohorts. So, so there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of diversity in how mental health is sort of measured, I think, across different sorts of cohort studies in, in terms of the approach. So I'm curious about what you can do that might combine uh, cohort studies or different sorts of data sets um, and how you might best approach that if, if you had a particular interest that needed to do that um, sort of a combination. Uh, so I'm wondering who might have been involved in that sort of work here. Does anyone want to put up their hand to sort of try and answer that one? I think it should be you, Karen. <laughs> yep, Karen, yep. Or Andrew, yep. Yes, um, so we've been involved, we've done quite a lot of this. We had a big study that Julie was involved with called Dinopta, where we pulled nine longitudinal um, studies in Australia and we tried to harmonise the measures. Um, and there's different statistical approaches. So there's, um, you know, item response theory where you can build complex models. The other sort of more basic approach is to look at the clinical cutoff, say for depression um, on different scales that's been validated independently on say the DSM and then use that cutoff as the same across studies. So there's different approaches to harmonisation, but um, it does give you, yes, a lot more statistical power if you can combine um, data sets. Mm -hmm. um, Any other thoughts on the approach? Sorry, go on. That you lose some information. It's a trade-off. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've talked a bit about privacy. We've talked a bit about some of the measurement challenges. If we if we thought about um, the contemporary methods of collecting data within cohort studies, something we're also quite interested in at the institute. I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has got some views about new new technology, new approaches that might be used to collect data from participants that are potentially useful for mental health related research. Has anyone got any views on that? Andrew, do you have any views on that one? Um, oh, sure. I, I mentioned before we've been we've been sort of um, trying out this smartphone um, uh, research platform called Ethica last year with an with a um, adolescent um, cohort of around 1,200 folks, and that was really kind of interesting to use because even um, as uh, you know, 
even though you're not this is necessarily i mean you can deploy sort of clinical you know, clinical diagnostic tools but this was a, a study looking at a, a range of kind of health and well-being outcomes including the k6 for, for adolescents for example but you know physical activity and diet and that, that kind of that kind of approach and um it with the, the kind of key feature of this was being able to get um you know like kind of really detailed information you know sort of daily or weekly estimates of these things coming in almost in real time you know as the as the questions were being deployed this you know so-called ecological momentary assessments and then sort of cross-linking that with smartphone sensor data so you know you, you can look at you know physical activity measures by you know how the phone's moving around and the pattern of phone use tells you something about whether people are in cars or on bikes or you know that kind of thing um and you know you know things like sleep and sleep duration based on you know the position of the phone and that, that kind of thing um so you know single single measures it, it weren't giving you necessarily you know, kind of the correct answer but going to julie's point before where if you've got you know um you know a measure from from relating to you know physical activity a measure relating to mental health you know and you put that together it's a bit like um it's a bit like an you know building up a picture with an mri scan you know you sort of get a a view through this plane and a view through that plane and you kind of you kind of arrive at almost a syndemic if you like for for some particular um, outcome of interest and so um you know, even though you, you know that study wasn't sort of necessarily you know, representative of all adolescents and so on the kind of really detailed trajectories of stuff that you can get through i think is a really useful way of, of measuring um exposures uh within individuals yeah Thanks, Andrew. Uh, does anyone else want to add to this? There's, a, there's actually a few questions coming through on Slido now, which I'll get to in a moment. But Julie, do you want to add? To yeah, go on. Yeah. Add one to that thing to that. And it's a thought that oh, I always have whenever people talk about, oh, you know, 24 hour measurement of people's blood pressure or, you know, because with wearables, you're getting all this data. But I, I, when you get the data, then you have to work out what the data mean. And so I, th I think, and I know that's what you're probably doing, Andrew, because I think, you know, we get all this information. And because we've never had that information before in relation to anything, we don't know what it means. So then beca that becomes our job as epidemiologists to turn yeah. that into something. Well, it, it kind of me has meant that we've had to, you know, start collaborating much more closely with data scientists and so on, because, yeah. you know, this is the sort of traditional methods of, that we use in epidemiology where we might have, you know, baseline or a number of waves and we've got, you know, our mixed models and time bearing, you know, all of a sudden we've got, you know, like the accelerometry data comes through, you've got millions of records, you know, and 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 working out, you know, if the phone's turned on and off, you know, we're like looking at screen time, you know, this this is not a straightforward kind of thing. And so you talking to the data science guys who who you know work with these kind of data and they've got a whole set of different yeah. measures and methods, which yeah. I kind of no. just <laughs> nod, nod and smile and pretend I know I'm following, you know. Um, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions coming through on Slido. Um, so one of the ones that is, is, is quite interesting is, um, how do we move from descriptive research using cohort data to using it for decision-making, forecasting, prevent, uh, pro projection and evaluation purposes? So how do we how do we have an impact with cohort data? I'm, I'm reading that is, how do we have an impact on decision-making and policy and practice? Uh, does anyone have a, want to kick us off on this one? what time it is this <laughs> heaps there's heaps uh annette you've got your hand up do you want to go first yeah i'll take the more general one then i'll leave the more specific one to others so so of course the thought is what what you got to think about before you start your research what is it actually going to achieve and and one can of course help the the probability of having an impact by involving uh, stakeholders in, in the research project uh, ahead of, of starting the, the actual analysis. Mm -hmm. But clearly have an idea about what you want to achieve with your research. That's very important always, mm -hmm. not just testing whether there are random associations. Mm. Any other suggestions? Hi. Pumi. Yeah, you're on mute, Pumi. Yeah. It's it's not so much a suggestion, but more a question to Annette around um, your comment about involving stakeholders. 
Um, if the stakeholders are potentially the funders, so like the Department of Health, um, the policymakers, how do you kind of navigate or kind of negotiate that conflict of interest? Well, they can pay for the research. If it's good research, that's not a problem. The problem is if they start uh, having thoughts about publishing findings, depending on what you find, that's that's the threshold, I would say. But of course, you'd want to help uh, uh, policymakers uh, find out things because that's a major chance of getting uh, impact you now that your research findings mean something. So we've got two other hands up. Uh, Karen, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks. I'll just add, add a couple of points. One is um, you need to be able to extrapolate from a cohort up to the Australian population or whatever country you're in. So you need to apply, you know, population weights or look at the issue in some national data sets. Um, the second one is, I would say, um, making sure you've got other relevant data in the in, in the cohort and also in the assessments and or adding in measures that are relevant to policymakers. So um, that's what we've done, um, added in questions, for example, on the Canberra bushfires or COVID into a data collection, which also has mental health so that we can then, you know, provide useful information. So I think it's bearing in mind, I mean, having the relationships with the policymakers and then bearing in mind what's going to be useful for that. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And there's a question about that that we might throw to in a second. But Julie, do you did you want to add to this? Yeah, um, that's my problem. How much time do we have? Because you know, yeah. that could be a whole webinar. But um, so one thing is, talk, people talked about projections. I, I think to to understand projections, you also have to understand cohort trends. Because if you just look at age and then project from age, the next cohort might be completely different because their upbringing might be different, all that sort of thing. The periods they've gone through. So with the longitudinal study on women's health, we see this really clear trend for much bigger problems with mental health as we go down the cohorts. Um, it gets better with age, but worse as we go down the cohorts. And so this is a problem we're raising with government. We have been for several years. It's You don't need to say much. You just put the picture up and people just take their breath in and, you know, then you... The other thing is, as Karen said about critical periods, so we've been, like I know SACS has, last year with COVID, we interviewed, we sent surveys to our women every two weeks last year, really quick, check how are you, and we asked them every time about typical questions, but also stress, and we did a particular one on mental health. We fed that back to the government so that they've been able to use that in their thinking about how they're responding to people's needs and um, money for mental health issues and that sort of thing. So that's really important. But I think you also want to look at how you can use your platforms, and 45 Up was set up for this, to use them as evaluative platforms to evaluate policies and services. So, for instance, the focused psychological services under the Better Access Scheme. How are they being used? Who's using them? How, how equitable are they? How effective are they? How long are they used for? All of that. And our cohort studies can do all of that with a whole lot of fancy statistics and um, computing. But they can do that. And I think we should be using them in a much more dynamic way to be looking at the impacts of policy and services. And that's probably Andrew's. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, but, you know, it, but they sort of have come out of that, um, you know, cohort studies that are these analytic, you know, studies that are about causal inference and, you know, cause and effect and, you know, traditionally sort of have fairly, you know, or potentially can have a very sort of traditional view around that. But as you say, setting them up so that they're, that they're more sort of responsive and dyna dynamic to what's going, you know, what's going on, um, you know, in, in the policy setting um, is going to, you know, make, make them more useful. Yeah. So there's a question online about um, what are the processes and rules for accessing these types of data, and I'm interpreting that as cohort data. So there was a um, workshop on that in March. All that information is available on our website, so we can make sure that um, link's made available to everyone, because um, there was um, some methods and processes described for both 45 and up, the Australian Longitudinal Women's Study, the BHI data I referred to, as well as the data from DCJ. So there is lots of information on how best to do that. The other um, question that picks up some of the answers that you all just gave to the to the previous one is about um, not just measuring 
uh, people's mental health status or conditions, but also looking at what sorts of things are disrupting people's lives. So I think, Karen, you talked a bit about the bushfires and Julie, you talked a bit about COVID. Is there more that you could say about the methods of trying to understand disruption on people's lives on mental health and wellbeing and how, how that might be approached with the cohort studies? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so one thing that cohort studies are good looking at is the impact of early life events. Um, so they've been used for that a lot. Um, you can do life life event measures in the longitudinal study. We measure life events and look at the impact of different life events. I think with the dynamic measures that Andrew's talking about, you could you could look at a lot. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'll think a bit more. Someone else needs to talk. Yeah. yeah. I think. I go with that. Um, I think the, this is where the longitudinal data really comes into its own because you've got the pre-morbid um, or the you know the, the assessments of mental health and physical health etc. before the event. So um, you know whether it's being able to look at social networks prior to lockdowns. If you've got a cohort study, you know the base, the sort of level of social networking in the in the cohort, the frequency with which they're seeing their family and friends. Then lockdown comes along. If you take a measure of the cohort during lockdown, you've actually you can actually talk about change with real data. So um, this having the cohort ongoing gives you that capacity to to measure the impact of history effects as they occur. Yeah. Um, just, I'm just going to check with Kate as well. Kate Dest, I think your camera is um, not able to be to work at the moment because the, your internet connection, but. From a, an analytical approach, do you have any advice for people about how to um, use disruption in, in your analysis? So how to look at how mental health might be changing due to particular disruptions in your life? Do you have any advice for us around the, the analytical approach for that? Um, hmm, thanks for that question, Martin. That's, <laughs> um, yeah, how long have we got? I, I think the key thing, I'm sorry about, I don't know why my camera's not working. It was working at the start. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I've done. Anyway, um, so I think the key thing is to really refine what the actual question is that you're trying to answer, as with any researcher, particularly, this particular issue in longitudinal data, which can be really, really complex. So I think the key thing is you actually really need to work out what it is, what is the research question, what is it that you're really interested in? And then, you know, there are different ways that you can look at, you know, changes over time, you can look at pre-post, you can look at um, modelling things that, you know, time as a covariate, sort of like a, almost a time series, depending on the number of observation points that you have. So it's kind of, I know that's a really vague answer, but it's really difficult to to be very specific um, in such a broad area. So again, I think just figure mm. out what is what, what what do you really want to know? What data do you have? And then that will guide you into what sorts of methods you can use. Yeah, I think that's. If a, that's anybody a, has anything more specific than that, I'm <laughs> happy to address it. But um, yeah, and often there's a bit of toing and froing about. Well, this this is what I want, but maybe you don't have all the data, so you need to kind of think. Yeah. think I think that's a that's a right. really important point around what is what is the question because it's important to be clear that you know cohort studies do certain things, but there are things that cohort studies don't do mm. as well. You know, so if you are interested in you know the impact of bushfires, for example, on you know hospitalization due to asthma or whatever this is a you know it's an ecological study comparing areas you know that have been affected by bushfires and areas that haven't been and you know looking at roots using routinely collected data which is you know which is an ecological question and cohort studies may not be mm. you know necessarily the best way to ta to tackle that particular question and it's an interesting subject itself, I think, Andrew. So as Julie said, both um, the Longitudinal Women's Study and 45 and Up have been collecting lots of data during the COVID sort of period. <clears throat> and lots of that's been used, um, you know, the descriptive analysis of that data has been used by different policy agencies. But picking up your point about cohort studies aren't useful for every purpose. I mean, what, what does the panel think? What are the opportunities? to use COVID data that's been collected through at least these two studies, the Longitudinal Women's Study and 45 and up, what are the real 
research opportunities for that data moving forward. So at the moment, I, I can't speak for a longitudinal women's study, but I know for 45 and up, it's mainly been descriptive analysis that's been produced. We haven't yet tackled what research questions might be asked with that data. Um, and I think there is an opportunity there. So I'm, I'm curious about what people think of it. Annette, I think you've got your hand up. <laughs> well, you did have your hand up, Annette. Yes. Yeah, I can. Uh, so uh, one of the things is, of course, the data source. So with uh, what some of people refer to as cohort studies, they really mean people uh, studies where data is being collected by the uh, of, from the individual. So through uh, questionnaires, and that's really useful uh, for studying uh, stressful life events because then they're self-identified. You can measure also whether this was something that the person perceived had an had an impact on them because something might be stressful for, for some and not for others. And it's very much the self-perceived part that you'd be able to collect. And I agree with Andrew that ecological studies are, are maybe useful for something, but you don't know whether it actually affected those individuals. And that's where the, the strength of the, the cohort uh, studies come in, if you have individual level information on it. So any thanks, Anna. Is there any views about you know, some priority uh, research objectives that could be could be um, undertaken with the data set that we're creating here with um, COVID not, data within 45 and up and within the longitudinal women's study? Do you have a view, Julie, about that? Talking about what we've done so far. So um, and Heather Forder is on the in the audience as well. Um, and so um, what we have done is we've had a look at who was affected during COVID. So, um, and I think, I, I, I'm not sure, Martin, but I think um, if you look on average, the effect isn't that great on people's mental health. It's a little bit hard to see, but, mm -hmm. but the younger people were, of course, the more their mental health was affected. So women in their 60s were not really affected much at all. They just got on with it and, you know, yeah, life was a bit more difficult and they had to juggle more things and they are worried about their husbands, but they just got on with it. But if you're a woman in your, um, th uh, late 20s or even in your 40s, life was really hard because of COVID. You might have lost your job. You have to stay at home. Your husband might be a bit of a bugger. And, you know, so all of these things in your homeschooling and life got really stressful for, and the, then it's who did it get stressful for? So, so some women were fine and some women, their mental health actually improved. We heard about that. But there are a group of people who were really vulnerable and they were the people who were always vulnerable, always disadvantaged, always finding it tough. And they did it really tough. So some people get better and some people get worse. The average is OK, but those people who got worse got really worse. So that's incredibly important um, to realise. And then you've got to look at the recovery from that because it's not just the impact. Um, what help were they able to get? Um, how did they recover? How do they come through it in two, three, five years time? Um, and then the other thing is about evaluation. So with the Better Access Scheme, Zenia Dolgegor, who works with SACS and works with us, and she used it for in her PhD to evaluate the Better Access Scheme, and she used propensity methods to, and Kate was her supervisor, so by Kate, um, to, to match um, the um, women who sought help through the focus psychological services and women who didn't, and to um, match them on a whole lot of things. They were pretty difficult to match because they're fundamentally different, but to try to match them and then have a look what happened to them. And I think what was interesting in that is it didn't take one cycle of surveys to see improvement. It actually took two cycles of surveys to see improvement. It took a long time. And I think that's the thing with COVID. If we're going to recover from it, it's going to take a long time. Um, and maybe we're all affected by it more than we think. Mm, mm. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting, Julie. So has anyone else got... Any other views about this? What are the, some of the priorities that could be tackled here? Karen, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, well, just in terms of the 45 and up data set, which I don't know very well, but I'm just thinking that you've got the uh, wonderful data linkage. So you could be looking at changes in health service use. And I'm also wondering about the longer term effects on the risk factors for chronic disease. Um, so are we going to see patterns uh, long term around uh, health behaviour and cardiometabolic risk factors associated with lockdowns and stress during this extended period. So I think some of those bigger questions you could look at. Mm -hmm. mm. Andrew, do anything pop to mind? Well, no, I, I agree. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the you know, the, the, the um, 
the key kind of strength of 45 and up is that is that ability to link to MBS items and PBS items and to be able to look at you know those trajectory you know it's not it's not you know an objective measure of an outcome but it certainly tells you something about um, why people are presenting to services and so on so the whole thing around telehealth and you know um, you know screening you know screening and you know management of, of chronic chronic disease outcomes are, it's going to be an interesting thing to watch mm. even looking at uh, prescriptions for um, antidepressants just over the last you know time series analysis over the last 10 years and seeing what's happened mm. in the last two yeah yeah and, and, and we understand there is lots of interest in evaluating the sort of mix of services that have emerged in the last sort of 12 months and they're they're actual sort of the long-term effect of those services on the, on the health and well-being so i think there is going to be a lot of opportunities um if we just throw to what's happening in other parts of the world that we might want to learn from i'm curious whether annette or pumi has something to offer us here so Annette, from a, a, a perspective from Denmark and maybe Pumi from some of the work you've done in Sri Lanka, as I understand it, are there, are there things that you think um, you've learned from those settings that would be useful to us, to us here in Australia? Annette, do you want to do you want to start? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, happy to see that there's become uh, more and more uh, linkage data available here in Australia because that could really be a very uh, interesting uh, resource to explore. And uh, in terms of uh, um, when you look at mental health, uh, of course, one would have to rely uh, largely on diagnostics in terms of uh, uh, codes, ICD codes for mental disorders. And yes, sometimes they are not completely correct and there might be some changes over time. But if you have a data set with, with uh, 25 million people, then those little errors are going to mean very little. And, and you'll be able to, to study some, some uh, uh, things in, in, in detail that, that not else would be able to be addressed. So I think that's really a very, very valuable resource to explore. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Annette. And, and Pumi, any, any experience from Sri Lanka or locally that you want to flag at this point? Um, so I think there's a lot of limitations in Sri Lanka at the moment in terms of cohort data, um, mainly because a lot of the, the data that's being collected and stored is paper-based. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there. Um, but I just want to touch on the point that Karen made earlier around um, measuring uh, mental health outcomes and, and making sure that they're appropriate. Um, it's something to consider maybe in an Australian setting. Uh, for example, in Sri Lanka, we don't have a common word for depression. So when you're measuring kind of depression in Australia for um, people that come from culturally and linguistically mm. diverse backgrounds, it's really important that these measures are validated um, for, for these populations. Yeah, uh, thanks, Pimmy. That's a great point. Um, so I'm just making sure that people have picked up in the chat. Amanda has posted the session that we did in March and how to find the link to that um, for people who want to know more about accessing some of those cohort studies. Um, so that's a couple of comments back. And then Sally's just posted about the fact that we are quite interested in the SACs about using cohort studies for evaluation. So if people um, want to talk to us about that, please do contact Amanda and her email address is there. Martin, can I make a comment about other cultures? And not, I'm not well placed to do it. But in Australia, when we measure mental health, we're usually me measuring problems with mental health. Um, but you can measure things like happiness and satisfaction and achievement and some other words which I've probably not experienced. <laughs> but but yeah, that means, I think in Denmark they're known to be one of the happiest places on it. So in uh, Nepal, they have a gross domestic measure of happiness. And I, I think we need to value these, you know, resilience and coherence, mm. those sorts of uh, positive, concept, positive traits, not just, you know, are you sad, are you lonely, you know, you worry yeah. about. Mm. Yeah, that's because, because they've got such great linked data, that's why they're happy. Yeah, they're really happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's of course very tempting and I'm very happy if I'm succeeding to make you envious of the data, but I, I should admit there are also uh, downsides to it because, for instance, when you just have clinical information about people, you don't know much about personal variables. 
and, and they might play a very important role, especially in terms of resilience or, or other things. And those things we don't know anything about unless we, we send out a large survey and try and link that to the data. But, but that's, of course, an option also here in Australia. OK, so there's another question about the genetics, the genetic factor in all this. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure which of the panelists have been involved with um, genetics research, but what are people thinking about at the moment in terms of the genetic role in things like aging and dementia research in particular and perhaps mental health if people have got views about that do, who wants to start there um karen do you have any yeah views about okay. the genetics of that yeah i mean the cohort studies are a wonderful opportunity uh, for biobanking um and developing um or have, having that information um and using genetic risk scores so um I know like in our cohort, we've developed a genetic risk score for Alzheimer's disease, and then we've been able to evaluate how much lifestyle contributes to risk versus genetics. Um, so yes, I think that if there's capability, it's going to add um, to what to all of the other measures, if it's used so properly. Path, path collects biological specimens, does it? It did um, initially, there was a DNA sample taken from people who consented and that was extracted. And so some genotyping has been done on that, but it's not ongoing. Yeah. It's not collecting it as an ongoing um, project. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think I think that's something we don't do very much in Australia is is connecting, you know, the, the you know, biological samples with with the cohort data that we collect, certainly compared to what they do in, the, in, in Europe and in UK, I mentioned the Olspac study before, but you know this is a birth cohort study. But they have, um, you know, they've got they've got bloods, you know, bl bloods, you know, core blood, you know, teeth, you know, all sorts of biological specimens on yeah. the kids and the parents. And you know, for mental health, it's a bit, you know, looking at sort of genetic determinants for, for mental health using you know GWAS studies and stuff. It's all a bit sketchy. I think I mean, this is not my area, but I mean, I think the, the kind of genotype phenotype stuff isn't as strong for mental health outcomes. As for other outcomes, but but certainly as a as a as a um, strategy for um, you know for getting better estimates of causal you know inference using you know Mendelian randomization and this kind of stuff, um, we just don't have that you know that, yeah. that you know that capacity here where you've got you know the genotype score on a database when you get it so that you can use some of these things routinely. It's, yeah. a, it's horses for courses, but it's a it's a horse that we don't have. <laughs> Uh, Julie, did you want to add to that at all? What, what's the experience of the longitudinal women's study? Um, so, um, in we are collecting biological data. Um, I'm not personally involved in that directly, but we have been collecting some biological data, uh, particularly, and we're getting genetic data as well. But we're particularly interested in it at the moment around um, premenopausal, menopausal women, and then looking at that, how that relates to sort of healthy midlife. So, and so we, we're getting there. Um, it was a long time coming, but we're getting there. Yeah. I think it goes, it goes back to that discussion we had around privacy as well. I think there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, sort of processes involved in, in, um, in getting access to, the, to these sorts of data and then of course storing them and, you know, curating them and all of that kind of stuff, which, I think you know there's better capacity to do that in the UK and Europe. And mm. the logistics, because we weren't just getting bl um, blood or cheek livers, we're getting a whole lot of measures at the same time. And then we started it during COVID, and sort of every time we opened up a clinic, there'd be an out COVID, and we'd have to shut it down again. So it's quite difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And just to round out this, so in 45 and up, there's been various collections of biospecimens over the years, although the scale is still relatively small compared to other studies internationally. So um, I think it's a it's a challenging area because of the logistics and the, the costing required. Yeah. Um, but certainly there are opportunities to collaborate, and I think um, that's probably where a lot of our effort will go in coming years, is collaborating with some of the big international cohort studies that have done this at scale, and, and, and actually local ones as well. Um, so we've got a couple more minutes if, if people have got other questions they want to put forward. Um, I think that there's a set of questions around sort of the data preparation and analysis that's required to do cohort studies. And I guess it's, you know, there's quite a lot of detail in all of that, but 
I'd say part of the answer to the um, the approach required is in the in the detail of the previous workshop. So people should spend the time to look at that. But I'm wondering if there's any um, basic advice because it can get complicated very quickly. But any basic advice on how to prepare um, for the analysis and the data um, the data sort of linkage that's required to do large scale research in cohort studies. Does anyone have any basic advice or or tips, suggestions that people things that people should prepare for to get that going. Work closely with uh, people. Martin, like it's this. Kate here. I'm happy to. Kate, yep, speak. go for it. Sorry, Kate, go on. So, um, so I think what's key is, as we've discussed before, is having a really clear understanding of what your research question is and then writing a very detailed statistical data analysis plan. So you need to, and that involves defining what your outcome is, defining what your exposure is, what your explanatory variables, what your covariates are, and um, you know, longitudinal data, any sort of data, but longitudinal data in particular can get can be very complex. You tend to have a lot of variables, you know, multiple time points, and it can be quite overwhelming. So what you need is a, a, a very um, very good analysis plan that's based on your research question. Um, sometimes you need to modify that over time. For instance, if, if you don't have all the information that you think you need, or you find something that you need to, requires a bit of modification. But, um, you know, uh, analysis plan is really key. And Pumi, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I'd say actually just having really good supervision and mentoring is really important. Um, having someone to um, ask for advice when the inevitable questions come up um, around handling the data is really helpful and also just having a network um, of EMCRs has been really helpful to me um, in, in doing my analysis. Um, just having a peer network um, that I can speak to uh, that I might be too when I have questions that I might be too embarrassed to ask my supervisor um, that's been really beneficial for me. And so, Andrew, you were going to offer up something as well. I don't know. I just said, "What? What do you do?" I said, um, "To talk, you know, talk to Kate Dest." Um, <laughs> okay. I think, I think the, the, I think the point that Kate made around these being really complex data. Um, I think we need to, you know, even even as, as sort of more senior researchers know our limitations with this, and this is why the, the gods invented biostatisticians and to work, you know, very closely with. Biostatisticians and and data management data managers who know how to how to handle these data and can advise you and can guide you along, you know, that process of understanding the data. That whole period of of loving and hugging your data. You've got to go through this, you know, love and hug the data for a long time before you actually do the analysis. The analysis bit doesn't take long at all, really. It's the mm. it's the, it's the paddling around the data and understanding it before um, before you sort of go to that point. Yeah. Uh, Karen, did you have something to add there? Um, well, I was just, what, I was just going to say what Andrew was saying. I mean, having supervised many PhD students um, in particular, it's, it's, you know, to allow months and months for that data preparation and understanding your data. So I think people just completely underestimate how long they're going to have to invest in that preparation stage so particularly for PhDs who are starting off that's just yeah. a bit of advice that I've learned over the years. Yeah, the other thing is it's not it's not wasted time either because often there's this pressure from you know because all the all of you know you guys PhD students all the career all sit in the in you know in the cubicles and you're comparing how many publications you're doing and you know on so and so's got paper this year and I'm still haven't got anything and you know it's not wasted time you know throwing yourself up against code that's not running or, or, you know, working out, you know, how to link data sets or whatever it might be. This is, you're learning all of these great skills and having to, you know, go through all of the supporting documentation for whatever R program or SAS program you're, you're using. Um, so it's, it's, even though it feels like you're kind of chasing your tail, I, I, I'd suggest that it's, it's actually really valuable, a really valuable period of time. I would suggest at least 90% of the time would be managing the data, understanding the data, um, and the actual, you know, the 
generating the models for your final analysis is probably is less than 10 percent probably five percent of the time that you need to spend and, it, and it also the other thing to highlight i think is a it's a team it's a real team team mm -hmm. process yeah yeah um sorry i know annette wants to say something too i did jump in but the, it's the it's the complexity and so there's complexity in missing data there's complexity in understanding the ranges there's complexity in the misscheduling and what that might mean you know you've got to understand all that and then if you're dealing with data with older people um well if you're dealing with data with younger people you'll have non-death attrition if you're dealing with data with older people you'll have attrition to non-death and death and so how are you going to handle that in your analyses and what does it mean so there's all this thinking to be done and tested out Annette, were you going to add something? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to add the sort of more hands-on advice because I fully echo it. Data management, it takes a long time, very long time, but it can also be very rewarding. But uh, before one starts, it's probably good to find out what type of software makes sense. There's a lot of different software packages for statistical analysis, and some are better than others, very much depending on the size of the data. If your data is very big, you do need a very good statistical software, so it's best to start on that one right away. And my best advice is always look at your data, always. Whenever you think your program does something, you can be sure there's an error in there. Yeah, it seems, uh, Andrew, you've got quote of the session, love and hug the data. It seems like the, <laughs> the theme here, so uh, thanks for that. So we're kind of at the end of the sort of question and answer um, component of this session. So I just want to check with the panelists if there's any other thoughts they want to share with the group, given we're coming to the end of the Q&A session. So I might just go around and just check if anyone's got any further con contributions they want to make. Uh, Kate Dest, is there anything you wanted to add to what you've said so far? Uh, nothing specifically, thank you, no. That's okay. Uh, Karen, is there anything you wanted to add that you didn't get a chance to yet? Uh, the only thing I just thought of something that Julie said that made me um, think that we haven't discussed the time interval between the assessments and how important that is with longitudinal research, whether it's minutes, days, years, weeks, mm. you know, et cetera, months. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Karen. Andrew, anything that you wanted to add that you didn't get a chance to? Uh, no, that's, that's fine, Martin. Okay. Julie? Uh, no. I'd be here forever, but I'm just thinking. <laughs> uh, Annette, anything that you wanted to add? It's a lot of fun doing data analysis. <laughs> don't, don't be scared. Yeah, yeah. Don't be scared, was that? Is that yeah, okay, great. Uh, Pumi, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah. I just had a question around whether or not there's a, a registry or catalogue of cohort data sets currently being undertaken in Australia. I think I found a report by the Sachs Institute where they reviewed all from a couple of years ago. That's got a that's got a summary of every cohort study in Australia at the moment and what it collects and how to access it and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's on the Sachs website or on the prevention part. Maybe it's the um, uh, Partnership Prevention Centre, perhaps. Yeah, there's a few reports over the years that I'm aware of, Pimmy. So we can make them available um, to people as part of the package from this session, um, what we already know about. Um, Julie, is there anything that you know about that is worth pointing people towards? No, but you, um, Andrew's just reminded me of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I might just uh, spend the last couple of minutes talking about the next steps from here. I'll just try and share my screen again. So just bear with me. So uh, probably um, uh, probably everyone's already heard this, but I'll, I'll just repeat that our SACS forum web page will have the, the recording from today's session as well as all the resources that we've just talked about and some of them were featured in the, in the comments section. I think there's been some really interesting discussion today and I'm, I'm actually curious and perhaps people could, could let us know if they're interested in taking this sort of theme a bit further, whether, whether it's worth us trying to set up something like a community of practice interested in mental health research with cohorts cohort data so if people are interested this it should certainly let us know and they can do that um, either in the comments section or uh, directly via email back to amanda or myself um, we do we are planning a couple of uh, workshops on other topics so we 
we do have one planned around working collaboratively in Aboriginal health research. So many of you would, would be aware of some of the work the Sachs Institute has been involved in before in Aboriginal health. So we, we want to talk um, to early career researchers about that, along with um, using cohort data in environmental health research, another um, pretty substantial opportunity for um, cohort data. So we want to unpack that one as well. Um, and I'll just leave up uh, as we sort of move towards the end. So this is the details of um, people you can reach out to at the SACS if you want to find out more about these sort of workshops and what we're doing. So you can certainly contact me or, or Amanda or Michael, who's um, helping us establish all of these forums. And there is all information on our uh, website as well as I flagged already. Um, so before we finish up, I, I do appreciate everyone taking the time to join us and, and go through this session, but particularly the, the panelists who are, are brought into this, not knowing much about what they might get asked in advance, but, but actually being willing to participate and share their expertise and knowledge. So really appreciate all of your time today. And hopefully um, some of the questions that people have have started to be answered by some of what we've covered and there will be more discussion and if people are interested in a, a communities of practice, I think that would be a really great way to continue some of the discussions that we've started and understandably on some areas it's only possible to go so far in a discussion like this. Um, so certainly taking it further would be really valuable for everyone, I think. So, so we might finish up there. I'll just check in with Amanda and Karen. Is there anything else that either of you wanted to bring up at this point before we finish off the session? Uh, nothing from me, thanks. We'll um, we'll communicate with all the registrants um, over the coming week. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, no. all the thanks to all the panelists, and so thanks nice for your help, Karen. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.